what do you think a, a few practical changes people could make would be um, to, to find flow states more regularly or in, in different, con more conventional settings? We've got 150 years of psychology, 25 years of neurobiology, right? Physiology, what's going on in the body, it's kind of a black hole. Like the measurement technology we need to start looking at it is showing up right now as we talk, right? That said, what we do know, to answer your question, is that flow states have triggers. Right now, we know of about 18 different triggers. These are preconditions that lead to more flow, right? And the, the first thing that you need to know is the most obvious. Flow is about attention. Flow can only take place when all of your attention, all of your focus is completely in the present moment, in the, in the now, is to, to use that horrible phrase. But, right, horrible phrase, but we gotta use it, it's true. These triggers, if you strip everything else away, they're focusing techniques. They're all the ways that evolution shaped our brain to pay attention to the present moment, right? So they're deeply hardwired in all of us. And we know flow is ubiquitous, so it can show up anywhere, in anyone, provided certain initial conditions are met. The reason action and adventure sport athletes are so important to this discussion is because they gave us a data set with which to work. We actually could say, okay, these guys have to be in flow to throw those double back flips. So we know, we don't have to wonder if they're in flow and we can work backwards and it's led us to these triggers. These triggers though, can be applied anywhere. Let me give you a simple example and kind of map it from one world to the other. The most obvious thing you think about when you think about action adventure sport athletes is the massive amount of risk they're taking, right? Risk. It's a focusing mechanism. It's an amazing focusing mechanism, literally under the hood. Whenever we take a risk, the brain releases dopamine, which is a primary focusing chemical. It drives attention into the now, right? It's also a big reward drug. It does a bunch of other things, but focuses our attention. Same thing with norepinephrine, which also gets released whenever we take a risk. Here's the cool part. You don't have to take a physical risk. The, you can take an emotional risk, a creative risk, a social risk. In fact, your brain can't tell the difference between social risk and physical risk. Same brain structures process them. It sounds kind of puzzling, right? Like why the hell would that be? Think about it. You go back 200, 300 years and you screwed up socially, right? You got banished, exiled. You didn't live. It was a capital crime. It was capital punishment. Nobody could live apart from the tribe. So the brain, because it's very old and it's been doing this a long time, processes physical pain and physical risk in the same place it processes social pain and social risk. So you, can, so you can swap these things out. You need risk, but it doesn't have to be physical and it's totally proportional. So Laird Hamilton has to paddle into a 50 foot wave at Jaws to pull this trigger. But the shy guy has to raise his hand in the business meeting and just speak up with this great new idea, right? It is totally proportional. Now, at an organizational level, though, so this tells us something really interesting. It says that organizations that rely on rapid experimentation, trying things out, trying things out, trying things out, and Jeff Bezos has a great quote that we talked about in bold, where he says, the success of Amazon is directly proportional to the number of experiments we run per year, per month, per week, right? But if you're going to run these wild experiments, you have to take lots of risks and you're going to fail. So you need that fail forward Silicon Valley attitude here if you're running that kind of organization. If you're not, it's just your own life. You still need it in your own life because if you take lots of risks, you're going to fail over and over and over again. And you're going to have to deal with that. But the upside is you're going to have much greater access to flow as a result and performance, productivity, motivation, creativity, all the things you get are gonna come online more frequently. Now, this is only one of 17 triggers. So if you don't, risk is not your thing, right? There's plenty of other gateways in. In fact, just to do this, creativity. When we make connections between ideas, the brain also releases dopamine. And you've had this experience. You've filled out a cross repository, <clears throat> get an answer right, get that little rush of pleasure and focus, that's dopamine, right? Whenever we link ideas together creatively, pattern recognition, you get more dopamine. There are ways to create conditions for pattern recognition in the brain. It triggers more flow. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want to take the physical risk or social or spiritual or whatever, fine, go over here, try creativity. Lots of different ways in. If what you've heard on Flow Research Collective Radio has been helpful, please consider doing us a solid and leaving us a review on Apple, Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this. 
Reviews help us connect to a wider audience so we can get these peak performance principles out to more people. Thank you.